trillion times. Thanks a trillion times. We honor you, Lord. We love you. We bless you. We glorify you. Thank you for everything. All the glory. All the honor. All the praise. We return back to you. There's nobody like you. Nobody to even be compared to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You've transformed our lives. You have made us more and more like you. And that is our greatest desire. That we be transformed into your image. That we be your reflection here on the earth. That anyone that sees us has seen you. Make it a reality for everyone. Even those that watch later. Send us from here as salt, as light to our world. Representing Jesus everywhere we go. In this closing moment, I ask the mysteries of your will, your divine counsel, will be made open to every man as we are now bringing things to a close. Let everybody see how to begin to engage, to live that life, to be that salt and light like you have called us to be. I give you praise. Thank you for making all things well. Thank you for divine manifestations, divine oppressions, and divine administrations. Thank you for the host of the angels that walk tires, tirelessly to deliver heavenly values to men and women here. Turn every one of us into catalysts for revival. Catalysts for change. Catalysts for reformation. Catalysts for transformation everywhere we go. We give you praise. We give you thanks. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. The final thought of my heart just before we break with bread and let you go, is on a subject called the essence of life. Why are we here? What is the purpose for this life that we are given? Some of you will live for 80 years, some for 90 years. Maybe there will be some that will reach 100. What's the purpose for that? Luke chapter 12, I just want to show you something quickly. Verse 13, I'm reading from verse 13. Yeah. And one of the company said to him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. So two brothers, their father had died, left inheritance, properties, who knows how much he left behind. And two brothers are fighting over what their father left behind. So they brought the case to Jesus. Go on to verse 14. I want you to see how Jesus answered in this matter. And I learned from him, when people bring family matters to you, be careful, don't take side. Husband, well, be careful, don't take side. Family matter, be careful. Look for the line of justice. But then I learned from Jesus, before even finding that line of justice, tackle something, the motivating factor inside who, human beings that causes, drives them to conflict. Bible says, where does fight, where does quarrel come from among you? Is it not for your loss and the ambitions which are in you? You look for it to fulfill it. You don't. That's unmet expectations. 
Most of the time, don't listen to people on what they are telling you. A lot of people will make mistakes, especially women. You go and take side. You are not supposed to do that. You are not a good counselor. If they can use emotion to manipulate you, then you take side, then you start attacking the man. Sometimes it's not the first to report that is correct. It's not the first to get to court. Sometimes it's even now one reporting that he's looking for trouble. You can't manipulate me with emotion. Women, you can't. It doesn't work. You're, when you finish talking, because I know what the constitution says. Did you submit to your husband? Were you playing your role? Were you honoring him like, eh, now you are complaining about his side, but you pushed the button, he responded. Yeah. When they finish with their mouth, they come before you and use crying and make you think they are good. I'm not a young pastor. I've been in this job for 30 something years, so you can see. I have gray hair on this matter. I've seen enough. So, because this brother is one that brought the case, you think he's go and warn my brother for me, Jesus. It doesn't mean he's better. Jesus goes. That's what I was telling you guys the other night on the kingdom. That after the do's and don't, the do, 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 don't, 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 there is a dimension to righteousness and there's also a dimension to sin that those who want to get this thing right must learn to address the realm of thoughts and motives. It is from the last commandment that Jesus lifted the standard. That is not just about do. You have to cure what leads to the action. That's where you start defeating sin. Don't wait till it is now action. Defeat it at the thought level. So, Jesus said, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? Just because I'm a pastor or because I'm your... When did I become the one that shared, shared family inheritance? So, Inan went to verse, verse 15. I wanted to see where he took the issue. He went to address covetousness. Let me give you another idea before I read this. You remember the, the time... Two of his disciples went and, and recruited their mother, James and John. And the mom came. He said, Jesus, I have one request. Let my son, one of them, take the position on the right and the other the position on the left. Any other thing left, let it be for the others. So when the other ten heard it, it started a conflict. They were very angry with James and John. I can imagine somebody like Peter. Eh, is that what you people went to plan? So, do you know how Jesus handled it? He said, you people that are complaining are not better than these two. Don't assume that because people are pastors and all that they have matured though. These ones are even apostles. Don't assume because somebody has a title apostle means that he he is spiritual or mature. Some of them still do bickering and quarreling. So do you know what happened here? Jesus brought a child before them and said, among the Gentiles, the rulers, the leader leaders, lord it over them. They look for position. They look for power. They look for possession. There are seven P's of personal, organizational, and societal corruption. Seven P's of decay. If he enters a human being, it will decay you. If he enters an organization, it decays the organization. If he enters a nation, it decays the nation. And that's what is reading our country, Nigeria. The P1 is power. Seeking for power. Oh, yes. Instead of looking for a way to serve. So he brought that young man and said, 
among the worldly system, they all look for power so they can lord it over them. Among you, it must not be so. Anybody who wants to be great among you or the greatest should be your servant. The P2 is position. VP and deputy VP. Let's take it. Whatever that is left, other people can take. So the other people, they don't have their own mothers too. If he didn't correct that the next day, Peter's mother would have arrived. And you know he had two boys in that ministry, Peter and Andrew. The P3 is possession. Money, 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 money. Reviews a lot about people. The P4 is pleasure. Sex. Women, opposite sex. So for a woman, it can be a man. But pleasure also goes beyond sex to other types of enjoyment. Like some people, you see who they are around food. You think he is spiritual. A bring food. How can you go loading up your prayer when the people are in line? Take small. Let them all go around. When everybody has gotten, you see that they have gotten. Then you can go back for a second serving. But you see something. They don't care. All that talking in tongue, that is the level of spirituality. Leave that tongue in shouting. This is the real person. P5, plod it. You know what is plod it? Praise. Accolades. That's why we like titles here. P6 is fame. Plod it is different. Plod it is praise. You want recognition. The other one is fame. P7 is people, is followership for crowd, for public. Some people will do certain things. Now, in ministry, some people for crowd, to have crowd, they will compromise all the values in the kingdom and be set. Don't you see some of these things some ministers are doing? If you just study us, you see that doing the right thing works. You don't need to be misbehaving. You don't need to. It's a, a deal I have with the Lord because he told me that the biggest problem he's facing with the last day's generation is modeling, modeling. He said, I have so many preachers, but I need somebody who will live the truth. And he told me, I, jo I don't want you to be fighting anybody. I don't want you to want to be the best preacher. I just want you to beat them in living the life that I called Christians to live just to live that and live a legacy of an exemplary life. He told me, will you do it for me? And I accepted. And I'm not saying I'm perfect, but it's such a difficult job I have found out. Just to model it. Everybody can talk it, who will live it? So that people will see that it's possible. Everyone can talk holiness. Who will live it? Everyone can talk about giving. Who will be a giver? Not who will receive. Who will give? Everyone can talk about whatever. Who will do it? Not only so that God's name be glorified, but also so that we can have a good example for God's people. That's my cross. And I'm willing to carry it. Because I know why. So I don't want to be among the richest pastors. It's not my dream. I don't want to drive the biggest car. I'm not interested. I don't want to wear the best. I'm not interested. I don't want to. But I want to. The law of the new covenant says love. I want to beat everybody in that. 
Share this thing is based on service. That's what I want to excel in. Share this thing is based on sacrifice. I want to excel in it. Share the goal is Christ-likeness. God help me to excel in that. You know what I found out? The more I push in that direction, the more these things that people are running after is coming after me. And it has shocked me and shocked me and shocked me. Those things, the more they are, as if when you pursue Christ, when you pursue the kingdom, there is a magnet now that you carry. It will be pulling those things that the world is looking for. Those things are good, are not bad by themselves, just like possession is money. Money is not a bad thing. But money is the result of productivity. You create value that solves people's problem, then you can get back money in exchange. But if you are collecting money from people without first solving problems for them, meeting their needs, you are stealing. I don't care what it is that you're doing, including ministry. You know, even ministry is an input and output system. It's the same thing a farmer. What, 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 how does a pastor get blessed? His work first is like a mother. You will sacrifice, go through pain, bet a child. You will also sacrifice to nurture that child. But later, that child is grown. It sorts you out. That's why everywhere I go around the world, once I land a country, because we have affected people over the years. Even if I take a, a vow of poverty, I can't be poor. Not because I'm praying to be rich. The issue is the amount of human beings. How many of you were really helped in this community? Let me see your hand. Do you see what happens? Change lives. Make impact. Add value. You're a businessman. What should you be thinking about? A customer. What will I do for my customer? What will I do for this segment of the market? How do I improve my services? How do I improve the quality of the products that I'm doing? What, what, how do I keep stepping it up? Not just about the money you are collecting from people. When you create value and you communicate value with excellence, then you are qualified to collect back value. You can make all the money you want to make. But how far will you go if you keep cutting corners, if you keep cheating your customers? The first time I bought, now after feeling, you package chalk and say it's a spring because you want quick money. That is Satan and his children. That's how they operate. Not a child of God. Because after I now find out, you have lost me forever. But customer service can lead you to customer loyalty. I think this is 1 King chapter 6, verse 7. Um, chapter 12, verse 7. Let me see if I'm correct in the text. Put it, put it up. The advice the elders gave to Solomon's son when he came to power. Yeah. Now, Solomon finished. He ruled for 40 years. Then he dies. His son, Rehoboam, comes to power. Young man. And so those elders that worked with Solomon and saw the, the prosperity, the peace of his leadership knew that his leadership is summarized in one thing, servant leadership. So they came to advise his son. This is how you are going to rule the people. You have just come to power newly. Because what happened is that there were some other young people advising him contrary, increase tax, increase different types of revenue, 
without increasing value being delivered by government to the people. Because Solomon built the temple, he built the city of David, he built the city of Jerusalem, he built, built, built. So there was a lot of revenue under him and now a new person has come, he has his own vision of things he wants to do. And they were advising him. The people will cooperate with you, give you the money, help you to achieve this vision. If you will first serve them, prioritize them, their needs and meet their needs. Look at what they said. If thou will be a servant to these people. Can you imagine a, a president, a king? If you will be a servant to these people this day and we serve them. The second thing in, second, in servant leadership is talk to people nicely. Don't talk from the position. Talk, be nice to people. He said, answer them. That answer them is actually listen to them. Be a listening leader. And that is the position God has taken. God is known as a God that hears and answers what? Prayers. He's a servant leader. That's why he came to the cross to die for us. Then the last thing is, speak good words to them. Then look at the the result you will get. Then they will be your servants for how long? Forever. Look at it. They will be your servants for how long? So you, the, the man that wants to prosper delivers the value first. Meets the needs of the people first. Be nice to them. Then you gain their loyalty and you will gain it forever. You know you're going to be contesting an election. You're going to be going to the Senate or House of Rep. So you need your senatorial zone. It is now that you are not ready for election. And you should go there and be doing social projects. And be serving. Touch the ballet. Touch the youths. Touch the women. Do it ahead of time. You have bought your way into the heart of people. So during the election, you might not have as much money as the big politicians. But because of what you have done for the police... You've been to the police stations. You've done some projects for them. You probably organized training that helped them get promotions. So even when they give them all that big money, they will still be loyal to you. Ah, Luke chapter 12, please. Let's, let's read that. So, they came to Jesus with Bickley, two brothers. They want him to get into family issues. A pastor now is the one doing family, settling land matter. Be careful, though. Be careful, men and women of God. Don't let people drag you into things that muddy waters, what you should not be doing. You can derobe yourself as a priest, meddling into some matters. Meanwhile, all that you are doing is to help sponsor another man's greed. So he said to them, take heed, beware. He's talking to the one that came to report to. Beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisted not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. So you remember the seven P's I mentioned, one of them is possession. Jesus is tackling possession now. Wealth, money, acquisition. He said a man's life does not consist of the abundance of what he possesses. And this is when the thing shook me. This came to me many years ago, but I've been in the faith for a while. And even as a young man, I had this dream to make it. I wanted to do. And now came into hard confrontation with this. Plus the fact that I've been reading that scripture. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle. And I have not resolved this thing. I want to go to heaven. So what is going on here again? 
Beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist of the abundance of what he has. I wish Christianity, churches in Nigeria, pastors in Nigeria will start teaching the values that Jesus taught. This country will completely be transformed. So it is at this moment I'm confronted with a reality. If it does not consist of how much I have in the bank, how, what I drive, what I wear, how much and what, then what is life consist of? It is when a breakthrough now happened to me because when you test for righteousness and you cry to God to show you something, he will open up your understanding. Actually, let me complete the reading. You know, to use that opportunity to tell them a parable, to teach a major principle about the kingdom of God. Look at the parable, yes? He tell the parable that the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. So his business blew, made billions. Yes, verse 18. And he thought within himself, verse 17, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room to bestow, to store the harvest. We have made so much money. We don't even know. We don't even have we have how to store it. We don't have problem of wealth. We don't have problem of security. Storage. And verse 18. Look at what he said. And he said to him, this will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and all my goods. Yes, next verse. And I will say to my soul, so thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. You have now achieved financial security, financial independence. You don't, you don't have to work any day of your life anymore. Even your children's children are already secured. So just relax and enjoy. This is what is driving our politicians and is driving many pastors and is driving many believers. Verse 20. And God said to him, you are a fool. This night your soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall be those things which you have provided? God said, this fool, this night, I'm taking your soul then let's see who will now enjoy the money. And what is the problem? Does God hate riches? No. He's one that created wealth. He says, silver and gold are mine. Does God hate rich people? No. Almost all the people you read about in the Bible that served him are wealthy from Job, they say, was the wealthiest man in the East. Abraham, David, Solomon, all of them. So what is the problem with P of possession? Now watch verse 21. So is he that laid up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see what the problem is. Can we say it together? One, two, go. So is he that laid up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. So do you know why the rich man's story and Lazarus, why the rich man went to hell? Pastors, whenever they preach, they say, the rich man went to hell because he didn't give his life to Christ. There was even no Jesus to give your life to. This is what happened past before the cross. It has nothing to do with giving your life to Christ. What it has to do is that every time God blesses you, he puts a Lazarus nearby on your gate. That Lazarus will decide your eternity. God will not judge you for the Lazarus near my gate. He will judge you for the Lazarus near your gate. The law of love said love your neighbor, not my neighbor. If you want to do charity as a person, start from where you are. Charity begins where? At home. But it doesn't stay at home. Look at your environment. You will see a Lazarus dying of hunger. While you are throwing away food every day in the dustbin. Somebody else has not been able to eat. You are buying a ticket for a different direction from the paradise that God promised. He 
He that laid up treasure for himself. So God doesn't have a problem with you having money and being blessed, but kingdom wealth is money with a mission. A portion is for you. A portion is empowerment so you can do a lot of good works and finance God's kingdom and touch a lot of lives. So I made a major breakthrough. A man's life does not consist. So an answer that cry. What does life then consist of? That's when the Lord showed me this secret. He said, look at nature. Yeah, look at nature. There is nothing in nature that exists for itself. Nothing. He said, look at it. So you understand why I made you. You look at mangoes. How they walk day and night. During the day, they are drawing solar energy from the sun, do, engaging in photosynthesis, and using it to create food. And finally, they create fruits. In the night, when everybody's sleeping, that's when they start ripening and maturing the fruits. And then one mango tree can have maybe 2,000 fruits. Some 800. Different sizes. And after working hard to produce this fruit, when last did you see a mango eating a mango fruit? Then what did you do? Why all this labor to produce mango? So that the birds can eat, the animals can eat, and human beings can eat. Everything exists to serve others. Let me go to you guys who are women, for example. Women, women. You're beautiful creatures because you are the one that carry life, not your life. You get pregnant, that baby is growing, and as the baby is growing, breast is growing, it's enlarging. Look at how much breast milk the women produce every time when they start lactating or when they uh, give birth and all of that. When last did you see a mother drinking breast milk? Then why are you producing it? That woman from the nine months of pregnancy to this breast milk issue is all doing that to serve another little boy that came into the world who at that time can't even say thank you. If you want to clap, clap well. Look at how many pretty girls are here. You're willing to disfigure your figure. And some get permanent disfigure because that stomach, even after the gym, it hasn't gone in. You're willing to disfigure your beauty. Some of you, when you get pregnant, your nose will become some their complexion. You still go through all that. For who? For another person. But is that all? Go and see what mothers go through. One is selling her crap. She hustling, doing all that. What is it? So I can raise my children. You see why God put that law? When you dishonor your father and mother. The, the consequences, you, when, you, you, when you finish telling the story. I see a lot of men walking every morning, they're out, walking. And there are some of them, like certain parts of the country. You see the guy, this guy will be sleeping in a stall. He lives there, he gets up 5 a.m. to bath his bag, selling. And he'll do this for years. After a while, he's able to build a house. Do other. They have deprived themselves of a lot of good. Then you ask him, what is it? So I can provide for my wife and my children. I want to marry this beautiful girl. And I want to provide for my children. This is the law that drives life. And this is exactly what God wants to see in all our politicians. This is what God wants to see in all pastors. 
This is what God wants to see in all Christians. People who live to affect their world. It doesn't mean you won't still have a life. But that is what is called the essence of life. You are created. You are given life. So you can live for your creator and to affect your generation. Let me give you two more illustrations. For example, look at the sun. That one walks there at night. Because when you think he has gone to sleep, because the sun has gone down in Africa, it's shining in the other part of the world, in the west. So he walks 24 hours. He doesn't have break. So I now ask Mr. Sun, every day you pour billions and billions of quantum of solar energy into the earth. We don't even capture all of them. Trees capture some. Excuse me, Mr. Sun. Are you in darkness? Why are you producing light? Have you ever seen the sun using his light? All the solar energy and heat you pump out. Are you cold? Have you seen it trying to warm itself? No. Why? If he fails to do his work, the earth freezes and all life will die. If he fails to do his work, the plants cannot do photosynthesis and food production will vanish. If he fails to do his work, animals will die, humans will die, plants will die, everybody will pay for it. When you want to bolt away from that marriage, I'm no more in love with you after making covenant. You bolt. If you're a Christian, you just abandoned your faith. There are some things you do, you're worse than an infidel. For example, the Bible talked about children who don't look after their family, their aged parents. And it talked about couples, especially like a man who will not take care of his family. He said, you have denied the faith and you are worse than an infidel. There are some things you do, you, become, you are worse than unbelievers. Because at least some of them have responsible enough to know that when you raise, give birth to children, you should raise them, train them well. They know. They look after their families. And now he's a believer. Divorce has become so cheap. And Nigerian celebrities and Nigerian Christians are beginning to copy it. I look at rivers like River Beno, River Niger. Billions and gallons of gallons of water. You know, there is a source where they're pumping that water. So, excuse me, River Niger, why are you walking there? Now? No, no resto pumping all this water. Do, are you thirsty? He doesn't drink his own water. Why? Communities are depending on me. I'm going to flow through so many communities. They are depending on me. The farmers, farming, are depending on me. The animals are depending on me. The birds are depending on me. Trees and vegetations are depending on me for their sustenance. So I cannot fail. I think there's a song I heard the other day. There is a prophecy over me. I cannot fail my God. I cannot fail this world or fail his word. I must fulfill my course. Do you know that just like all these other things, that's also why you are created. You are created to serve and meet the needs of others. But you see, the mystery of life and its purpose is that you have a phone in your hand. Does phone make phone call? Does phone send WhatsApp message? Does phone want to watch video? So phone, why do you want to do? I'm serving human beings. Anybody that wants to make a call goes through me. I help him do it. He wants to watch. I help him watch. Why don't you watch? Because I don't exist for myself. But here is the mystery. There is something else that serves the phone. is the charger. Charger, why are you charging the phone? Don't you charge yourself? No. 
none of us exist for ourselves. We exist to serve another. There is something else that serves the charger. It is a socket on the wall or somewhere. Socket. Why are you producing power, giving it to the charger and all these appliances? Why are you not keeping power for yourself? He said, no. If I store the power, I have lost my purpose for existence. It is transferring it to the charger. Who transfers it to the electricity? Or who transfers it to the TV, to the fridge, or to the phone? That is my purpose. But there's something else that serves that socket on the wall. It's a wire coming from somewhere. Why, why are you drawing power from generator and giving it to the socket? Because the socket has to distribute power, so my job is to supply it to him. I don't store power for myself. Once I start hoarding, I start dying. Once I stop distributing, I've lost my purpose. Giving is living. Hoarding is dying. Can we do a small experiment? Everybody, all the thousands of people here and those watching from around the world. Breathe in. And then when you breathe in, you hold it. I'm also going to join you. Oh yeah, breathe in. Let's hold it for one hour. <laughs> what will happen? You are allowed to breathe in. But it's a command to breathe out or you break the system. You are allowed to make it. You are allowed to acquire. You are allowed to be rich. You are allowed to be blessed. But God's purpose for blessing you is so you can be a blessing. God's purpose for saving you is so you can be a savior. God's purpose for healing you is so you can be a healer. God's purpose for delivering you is so you can be a deliverer. God's purpose for making you wealthy is so you can become his distributing channel. He called Abraham, he said, come, I will make you great. I will bless you so you can be a blessing. Then he told him, indeed, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I will use you to touch every nation. That means the capacity of blessing I'm going to pour in you cannot be contained in one corner. How many of you are ready for wealth of nations? You know, there are four layers of wealth. There is a level of not enough. You're always hungry, struggling. You're always in debt. That's not good. God didn't plan that for anybody, any believer. There is a level of just enough. That level, you can pay your bills. You don't have. That's not God's best. Then there is a level of more than enough. You now have more resources than you actually. How many rooms can a person sleep in, in a house? Is it not one? So, you live in a 26 room mansion. So what? You better provide accommodation for some people that don't have. Look for Lazarus. He's your neighbor. Even if he's BQ, give him. He said, no, I don't want him here. He will create security risk. Then go and build him his own BQ. So you can be safe. I need to say it again. Good works does not only trigger the blessing for more pros productivity, more prosperity. Good works is what secures your wealth. If you're a company, you are making wealth from a community. Take a portion, even if it's 5%, keep investing it in that community. Be developing their youths. Be developing. Well, sometimes the ballet, the king, the roof is leaking. Be the one that will go and do it. Maybe even the one that will help uh, finance his coronation. That is how you secure your wealth. You see, when you touch lives, you make more wealth. God will move you up. But not only that, you gain security for what you have acquired. When you hoard it, you are setting yourself up for a fall. It's Christianity that invented social responsibility. It's Christianity that brought all this. You don't command it. You teach it to people. And they leave it. Then leaving it is what makes us light and salt on the earth. He said, let men see your good works. And they will glorify your father that is in heaven. As we are getting ready to leave camp meeting. 
I want to hear. Each person here multiplied by hundred. Hundreds of life that you touch in the next 12 months. A lot of life changed because you attended coming because of you. Testimonies of lives that were altered because of you. If you leave and all this ends with you, you wasted your attendance here. If you after watching all this from around the world, no life, no outlet, you wasted this whole thing. How many souls will be warm because you, because of you? How many poor people will get breathing space because of you? He said, but I'm poor. When a poor start helping the poor, a higher hand lifts him out of poverty. That's why charity never frees the poor from poverty. It consolidates him in poverty. AIDS will never solve the problem of, of nations that are getting AIDS from abroad. That is not how to get a nation out of poverty. It's, it's a remedial something to help people not to die. A nation will get out of poverty when it starts producing what other people need. When that nation starts serving and adding value to other nations. When you start exporting what you are creating, that's how you change your economic reality. It is when you are the giver that you rise, not when you are the taker. Yet, we're all allowed to get back as long as we're given. It's the same thing you do when you breathe. When I breathe out carbon dioxide, then the plants get it. That's what they eat. So that they can create food, do other things. But the what they breathe out, which is oxygen, is what I get. That is how the whole system of life is built. On the principle of giving and receiving. On the principle of exchange of value. That's how you make money in the market. That's how you grow in your Christian faith. Every commander about those. So lift up your hands and pray in the spirit for one minute. Let this thing sink. That book, The Essence of Life, will change your life. It's a book you must leave committing with. Because it now goes down to show you the how. I don't have the time. Or how to become a world changer. And how to become big too. How to grow to become big. An exceptional person in your world. It's a life-giving river. Oh, let it flow right here, right now. As the river flow, it brings It's a life-giving river. Oh, let it flow right here, right now. As the river flows, it begins to bring everything to life. It's a life-giving river. Oh, let it flow right here, right now. What happens to that believer who holds his own water? He becomes a dead sea. And he will start stinking and killing everything around him. What happens to a star that stops shining out? You don't want people to enjoy solar energy and light. What happens to that star? It implodes. When your own gravitational pull becomes stronger than your need to shine out, what happens? Implosion. And those stars in space, they call them the black holes. And anything that comes around them, they suck it in. You become a bitter water. You start destroying other people. You start poisoning other people's life because you're a bitter person. Somebody hurt you. That's why you stop being a blessing. Somebody failed you. You know, many years ago, one of the sons I trained betrayed me, backstabbed me, did some terrible things. I said, no, 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 no. I don't trust human beings again. I don't want to. Then the Lord came to visit me. He said, listen, do you know what I went through on the cross? Do you know what Judas did to me? What if I stopped loving? What if I hoarded everything? Will you be saved today? I said, no. He said, this is what you must do in ministry. I said, as the sower goes to sow, some seed fall on the wayside. Some fall on stony ground. But finally, some even fall among us. 
But finally, you get this one that fell on good ground and they bring back the harvest. So he said to me, keep increasing the scattering so you keep increasing that 25%. Keep increasing. If you used to raise 100 sons, raise 1,000. If you used to do 1,000, move it to five. So the 25% from where your harvest come keeps increasing. Don't stop loving because of somebody that messed up. Don't stop giving because of somebody that is unfaithful. Don't stop serving because of somebody that did not appreciate you. Don't stop being the light. That's what you are called to be. That is who we are. Don't stop being the salt. That is our destiny. This is who we are. As he is, so are we in this world. Get over it. Your next level is waiting for you beyond that hurt. Your next level is waiting for you beyond that disappointment. I will not be the man that I am today, carrying the degree of glory that I carry, if not for some trying times that I've been through in life. That's why I protect those that are going through pain. I protect those that are being persecuted. I will go and be their friend. I protect those that are being maligned. I have been through, I know. I know how it pains. I know how it hurts. I protect men who are after righteousness. Because that's the same cry that is in my soul. And I know that that journey sometimes can be a lonely journey. I protect the weak. I protect the ones that are struggling. They are the ones I befriend. Because I once struggled. Just because God has lifted you doesn't mean you forget where you come from. I mean, it's nobody, complete nobody. But for the hand of God. But for the indwelling. But for the mercy of God. But for the grace of God. But for somebody who took time to love me. And then out of clay molded something. That's why we are Davidic in nature. Because we came from the backside of the forest. We came from nothing. We came from... We don't boast to God even when we give to him. We give it with all. Because we know that we are nothing before. And when we give to people, we don't insult them. We give it to them and protect their dignity. You can spoil a good gift by the bad mouth that you add to it. I want to end this way. Just keep standing. I'm about to pray. There are three reasons why God made you. you. Get the book, you will see details. But one, he made you for himself. The creator that gives everything life needs something back. The creator that is love, that loves everybody, needs something back. He needs love back. Money, he will give you. Promotion, he will give you. Healing, he will give you. He doesn't need healing. He doesn't need money. He doesn't need all that. He needs something. Just love. His heart cries for you, relationship. You see, when Adam messed up and went, he was one that came. It wasn't Adam that went back. Adam, where are you? He was looking for his friend. He used to leave all the angels, come down at the cool of the day every day. Just a fellowship with man. That's why the Bible says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man, your God's heart yearns for you. God loves you. He told me when I get here, I should leave you at the closing service of camp meeting with that statement again that he loves you. You are the only thing his heart yearns for. That was why when we all got lost and, and all that, he came again and died for us. What he wants is relationship with you. That's what he wants. What he wants is thank you. I appreciate what you're doing for me. I love you, Lord. It's not because anybody forces me. 
is real from my heart. The Bible said, delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you all the desires of your heart. God does not want you to be using him only when you have needs. He wants you. He wants you. Not just what you have. He wants you. What you have, he is the one that gave you and he will give you more. The second reason he created us is for one another. He created man so that we can meet the needs of others. We can't solve all the problems in the world because there is a limit to man. But there are problems I'm created to solve. There are things I'm created to do that will impact the lives of others. And that is where my greatness will come from. And the third and final reason he created us is to be stewards of creation. To be masters of creation. He gave us dominion over creation. Not over one another, over creation. We fulfill that thought purpose through work, W O R K, your profession, your vocations. It is through that you earn a living, through the impact you make on people, and through the work you do, is how you get your money. There are three reasons why God created the church. I'm, I'm ending. He created the church first for him. We are a bride. We are somebody's wife. We are bride of Christ. He created us for relationship again, for union. That's why our first ministry is ministering to the Lord. Secondary, he created us to be a family, to provide love, fellowship, service to each other. Study the one another scriptures in the New Testament. You will find the second purpose of the church. Your role in the body. He put us in a family called the church so that we can meet each other as he may serve each other, bless each other, use our gifts and talents to be a blessing to each other. So you see, after him is us. You exist not just as an addition in, on earth. You are actually very important. And no other person can do what God created you to do. Because this thing called purpose has a unique signature to it. Ah, the last reason why he created the church is for society. That's where he made us the light and the salt of the earth, of the world. Oh, 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 oh. What makes salt lose its savour? When Jesus said, if the salt loses its savour, it's no more useful. It's only to be cast out and be trodden on the foot of men. What, whatever, what we do here is... When we think about salt, we think about is used in soup, in food, to produce seasoning. Salt has three major purposes. In the ancient time, they use it in making manure. They use it in making manure. They also use it for cooking food and all that. They use it as preservatives. Yes, if you go to the Dead Sea where they get the salt in Israel, the order beyond sodium chloride, the other things there, potassium and many others. I've been there. So they put it in, in animal dogs to create very rich manure that causes plants to grow. God said that's our role on the earth. What makes a sword lose its value? Adulteration. So what they used to do there in the middle is they go and get sand, white sand, add to it to be able to make more. You know what they do to palm wine? They get palm wine, pour a lot of water, it stops testing night. Some people do it to petroleum products. Eh? They pour sand to make it more, so they can make more profit. But then when people buy it, it puts more, it's sand. It has to be thrown away. It has lost its value. It's now thrown away and you can match on it. Adulteration. What makes us lose that our transformational influence is that we start copying the world. We're supposed to be counterculture. We're the ones that are supposed to be the model. We're the ones that are supposed to be raising the standard. 
He said, oh, be not conformed to the world, but be it transformed by the... We start copying the world system. We start allowing the world adulterate us, adulterate our values. You see, we're supposed to go into the world, reach the people, we, by retaining our values. And at that moment, let me tell you a secret as you leave committee. Once you lose your credibility, you have lost your power of testimony. You preach, unbelievers will laugh. Because they know you. Every night you are doing poco poco. They see where you go to carry women. And tomorrow you come and carry Bible preaching. That's what makes people more Christianity. But one Christian that retains his credibility is a sort. He's so powerful in any environment where he is. All Satan's attempt is to weaken your sort quality. All these temptations. And once, and I don't care if you have been doing the thing, getting away. He, the devil is watching. Once he gets to a point, he will remove the covering. You think you are hiding. And let the world see your nakedness. At that moment, whatever you like, preach. Whatever you like, come up. They, don't, they laugh. As a man of God, protect your credibility. As a believer, protect your credibility. You should start losing it when you start becoming worldly, copying the world. You know, an uncle of mine, I was trying to lead him to Christ. He said, I will believe in the gospel because of you, because I've watched you over the years. I've been watching you, you don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand what is going on here. Satan is after your credibility. You think you are getting away and be misbehaving and be hiding. Don't worry. He is the master of darkness. When he reaches a point where the disgrace is enough for him, he will open it and open it. And every time the kingdom of darkness throw one party, we have de destroyed one witness. Because now his witness is no more credible. Even in court, a witness can be disqualified. If he is found culpable. The first reason we exist as church is to minister to the Lord for him. Second reason is for a family. You see how they're teaching us covenant. So we can look after each other. Take care. Not cheat each other. Not take advantage of each other. The third reason the church exists for the world. We are given a mission to go and reach the lost. And reach the world. And we are the light of the society. We are the salt of the earth. When you live here, make a commitment to be that person. Being salt and light. Some people say it's only about being. No, it's about being, it's about saying, and it's about doing. The same part is when you are preaching. But it's first being it. That's how you have the credibility. Then the third is about doing. It's about good works. And, and, and I end with this scripture. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Jesus died on the cross. So he can produce a people that are zealous for good work. Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Watch. Who gave himself, he died on the cross, gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. The first reason he died is to redeem us from all iniquity, to save us. The second reason is so that he can raise a generation of people that are zealous for good works. When you live here, what are you going to champion? Don't sit down and be talking about this one is not happening. Start it. This one is not going on. Start it. This thing. We need something like this to be started. And when you are getting results, send us information. Everybody has to be involved. We need the whole church to reach the whole world. Bow down your heads. Make a commitment to go here to live a life of value. To live a life of impact. Whatever you were doing, double it. Whatever you used to do, double it. The ones that have not started, start. 
go plant a church, start a cell, start a campus initiative. Go change your world. The world is waiting for you. What we have cannot be found in any other place. It can't be found in any other religion. Neither can it be found in any other system. What God gave to the church. What God gave to believers. Let God give you a vision of what you can start doing. If you start engaging in your purpose, your world will change. You start living on a new level because you now start living a life of fulfillment. You are created to serve. You are created to be a world changer. You are created to be a savior. You are created to be a deliverer. From now, start healing the sick. Don't worry about whether they will be healed or not. It's not your job. It's the Holy Spirit and the angels. It's Jesus that will do the healing. Your job is just to pray. The reason he gave us that job is so that they will know who healed them. If you don't do it, they won't know. They will give the credit to the devil or to some other person. Just do your part. Leave him to do his part. Start praying for the sick. People are hurting. The world needs healing. And God needs you to take it to them. The world needs salvation. And God needs you to take it to them. The world needs deliverance. And God needs you to take it to them. Our world needs changing. And God needs you to take the change to them. All of you watching from around the world, pray. Ask God to show, show you how to begin. Get a copy of that book, The Essence of Life. It will change your life, my friends. <laughs>